The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, were as concerned with treating the body as they were with treating the soul. Long before the emergence of conventional medicine, they left behind a rich source of medical wisdom addressing the health and well-being of the human body. It is only recently that science has begun to discover the medical knowledge that was already introduced by them centuries ago. Today, there are many skeptics of Islamic medicine and other forms of alternative therapy. However, with the rising failure of conventional medicine, such as its inability to prevent side effects, the growth of antibiotic resistance and much more, people are increasingly turning towards natural alternatives to help combat incurable illnesses and diseases. With the help of experts, we will investigate the effectiveness of traditional Islamic healing, as prescribed to us by the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. We will attempt to provide scientific verification for the most notable remedies presented to us from Tib al imma The principles of Islamic medicine are actualized through treatment techniques and medicinal agents to address the multidimensional nature of life. These therapies include spiritual practices, spiritual prescriptions, counseling, attar or aromatherapy, fumigation or the burning of incense, sound and music, herbal medicine, food medicine, including dietary guidelines, recommendations, prohibitions, and fasting, prescriptive exercise, hijama or cupping and bleeding, hammam or hydrotherapy, manual therapies such as bone setting and massage, acupuncture, and surgery. Tib ala imma refers to a comprehensive compilation of medical advice collected during the era of the imams by companions who observed and recorded their methods of treatment of the ill. The Prophet and the Imams were herbalists. In particular, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, Imam Musa al-Kadhim and Imam Ali al-Ridha were well known for their use of natural medicine. And the work of Imam al-Ridha, titled al risal al dhahabiyya or the Golden Medical Dissertation, became especially distinguished. You do not have to be a Muslim to be treated with Islamic medicine, but you must be a believer to practice Islamic medicine. This is where the prophets and imams come in. Their example, advice, and supplications teach us how to rethink how we see and understand ourselves, others, the world, and life. Modern medicine owes a huge debt of gratitude to the imams of the Ahlul Bayt. Though unfortunately, despite their great contributions to medical literature, for most of us, it is not the first place we look when it comes to finding a cure. Tahir Ali is a doctor of natural medicine and has been seeing patients for 15 years. Many of the remedies he uses are directly derived from the narrations of the Imams. I've studied herbal medicine, iridology, naturopathy and homeopathy. When I was a lot younger, I had, pain, I had kidney pains and I went to the doctor and they said, there's nothing wrong, kidney looks fine. Uh, and a friend said to me, why don't you try Chinese medicine? So I went to a Chinese doctor and straight away he diagnosed exactly what was wrong with my kidney. He gave me the treatment and the, the pain went away. So I thought, well, okay, this is natural remedies and natural things is surely more beneficial than taking a drug. So I, I did a bit of research, found it interesting and um, I tried treating myself with a few, a few other ailments and it worked. And at that point I became Muslim. So naturally, being Muslim, you want to, if the, the Holy Prophet or the Imams have a, a, a cure for something, you want to try that. Or, you know, for example, you have the advices of the Imams of what to eat, and when to eat, and when not to eat, those type of things. So I found when I uh, followed those, I, I felt a lot healthier. I've been practicing for 15 years, and I... I treat with herbal medicine mostly, and um, occasionally I use homeopathy and homotoxicology as well, but primarily uh, my use is herbal medicine and I try to incorporate uh, Islamic medicine into that as well. I've, I've treated over 200 people, well over 200 people with infertility, um, 
eczema, asthma, allergies generally. Uh, I've treated a lot of a lot of children for that, especially um, a lot of children with hay fever. Cancers I've treated, heart disease I've treated maybe eighty plus people with heart disease, um, lung disease, be it uh, emphysema or other bronchial problems. I've treated quite a few people with that. My name's Armin Merchant. I'm 20 years old and I'm doing computer science in university. Um, I live 15 years in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, and now I live in London. Currently, I have eczema all over my body, um, which it's progressed to that. I didn't always have it like that. I suffer from a lot of dry skin and recently kind of bumpiness of the skin, which then turns into scabs, which then leaves scars. Um, my face really suffers from dryness, especially like a redness and flaring of the skin as well. I also have hay fever and asthma. I've had both of those as long as I can remember, as well as my eczema, I was born with it. As a kid, I would have um, scars like on my legs from my eczema. And so like as a kid, when I didn't wear hijab and stuff like that in school and PE and stuff like that, I'd be really, really self-conscious. Uh, I'd um, drop out of PE a lot. I'd try ditch. Um, and then as I got older, hijab really helped in covering that, to be honest. Um, but once I came to London for holiday and my whole face flared up and it was purple and it just wasn't going away. And there would be days where like I wouldn't leave the house. I just, I wouldn't really talk to people. I just try to stay away as much as possible. Um, but at the same time, like now that I've kind of grown to accept it and Alhamdulillah, like it doesn't get that bad anymore, I suppose because of the steroids, um, it's just kind of made me not care about how people see me. And as long as I'm content and okay with how I feel about the way I look and I know that this is just the way it is, then um, I don't really mind anymore going out and stuff like that. And like people can judge me, but I don't really care. So far, I've been given a lot of steroids to deal with my eczema. I've been given hay fever tablets, things like Atarax and stuff like that to stop the itchiness. Um, just a lot of very um, oily creams as well to soothe the dry skin as well. The first steroids I ever actually started with was this one, which is the Hydrocortisone. Um, I'd use that for my face and actually it was completely just thin out my skin, but I'd have to use it as often as I really could. The steroids do work really quickly. Um, they're really good at getting rid of the symptoms really fast, but then they'll get rid of it and they will come back again. And as soon as I stop using the steroids, it will come back, if not worse, than it was before. You can tell that they um, weaken my skin, they make it thinner, they definitely age my skin, and they leave my skin a lot more sensitive. And that's probably why when the eczema does come back, it comes back worse than usually before. Um, it also makes my skin a lot easier to wound then. So if I'm scratching, it's a lot easier to wound my skin and then causing scarring after that. Then I have like three different steroids over here. Um, they're all aimed at different stuff. Um, this one is for when I get, like, when I scratch because my skin is so sensitive and really thin now as well. The second I scratch, I get bumps on my skin and it goes red and it wounds really easily, like I mentioned before. Because I get wounds now, because my skin is so sensitive, I have to use this steroid over here, like, all the time, constantly applying it um, to the wounded area to help it heal and... Um, it causes a lot of pigmentation in my skin and it changes the texture of it. It's just having to constantly apply it within my day. Um, it takes up a lot of time as well because I have to wait for the steroid to dry and then I can apply the moisturising cream afterwards. So it does take up a lot of time in my day as well. They gave me the Atarax pills to help stop the scratching and the inflammation and to also help the hay fever but they just completely knock me out and then I can't do anything in my day. If I have them at night, then even in the morning, I'm so drowsy, I just can't think properly, I can't get anything done, so I really don't like using those. So some people may just think that eczema is just having dry skin and it's not that big of a deal, but actually it consumes my life, literally. Like all of this has to go on every single day, maybe twice a day, um, it takes hours and it just, it really just consumes your life. Amina has been suffering for years. 
With the never-ending prescription drugs from the doctor, which are doing her no good, she has decided to turn to Islamic healing in hope that it will cure her skin condition once and for all. We will be following her course of treatment for five weeks to investigate whether or not the remedy has an impact on her skin. The way I usually do the consultation is by making the patient feel as comfortable as possible because they're speaking about very personal issues. They can clam up and you know, they can forget things or feel shy or embarrassed to speak about them. So I try to make them as comfortable as possible. Then I, I check the iris, but I don't just put the light straight into the eye. I take it, put it from the side and bring it slowly closer so the iris has chance to, and the patient has chance to get used to the, the, the light near the eye. Then I slowly work around the iris and check all the markings in various areas. Um, and as I'm going along, I tend to ask the patient questions about certain things like, do they have breathing problems or uh, is there any diabetes in the family? Um, you know, do they suffer from constipation, menstrual issues, all kinds of things, do you have headaches? And by the time I finished, I've got a, a complete picture of what's happening in their body. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, you, you don't breathe very deeply. Your yeah. breath is very shallow, so you need to breathe more, get more oxygen into your lungs. Um, your issue is liver-based okay. and also kidney-based. Also, your immune system, your autoimmune system is, is out of balance. So your autoimmune system is basically attacking itself, it's attacking the body. So this is exasperating your condition. Some things they're aware of and other things they're not aware of. So you may say, oh, you know, you have, do you get pain in this part of your body? And they say, oh, no, I don't. But then when they think about it, they say, oh, actually, you know, I do get a pain, but I just don't realise it. So there's things that people aren't aware of because they've lived with it for a long time. You are allergic to dairy. Really? Yes, all forms of dairy. So wow. you would need to change to goat's milk or um, maybe soya-based products. Is that like mildly allergic? No, a lot. Really? Yeah. Wow. And, and with something like eczema, you need to remove the things that cause the allergies for sure. the, so the body has a chance to heal. Then I, I have a, a patient sheet. I write all the, uh, the things that I see. Uh, from the iris and at the end I, I put that together and I'll, I'll mix them a formula that is specific to their, their condition. I give them a, a diet plan and uh, the, the way to take their medicine. Wheat is something you need to, for a short period of time, remove from your diet okay. or you have gluten-free alternatives. So okay. there's gluten-free breads, um, gluten-free pastas, there's a few gluten-free cereals Try these for a period of a, uh, around a month, just so it takes the gluten out of your system, mm -hmm. so or your out of your diet rather, so your body has a chance to heal. You know, they stay in contact with me, and any issues that come up while they're taking the medicine, they can speak to me, and um, you know, we'll make adjustments to the diet or to the medication depending on what's happening. Say, for example, the medicine is too strong, you'd lower the dosage. If it's not strong enough, you'd increase the dosage. So, you know. They may get a headache after two or three days, and that's simply the body starting to detoxify itself. So, you know, these these things kind of happen, and you, you just you you stay in constant contact with the patient so that you can uh, adjust what they're taking to get to the desired result. Natural remedies has only recently become something that I'm more aware of, but before like you just kind of took what the doctors gave you because it made sense and you just kind of went with it only recently because I'm just tired of it and I recognise it's doing more damage to my skin than good. Have I actually been trying to look for different ways to go about treating my eczema? Do you have a lot of sugar in your diet? Um, like at times I'll have a lot of sugar and then okay. I'll go a while without having a lot of sugar. Okay. So would you say you have a sweet tooth? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. That has to stop, yeah. No, it's just lesson. If there was a natural remedy that did improve it, it would be a lot easier, I think, to go about my day-to-day -day life. I feel like um, I spent a lot of time just trying to stop myself from scratching and actually mentally that causes a lot of um, problems for me as well. Um, I feel like I'd just be able to do things and just be more comfortable within my own skin. My treatment plan for the sister um, obviously there's the dietary changes which I've already spoken about. The other things would be um, to use a cream with 
a good quality cream of honey in, which is from Tib. Um, also to increase cold pressed olive oil, black seed oil, and remove very heavy fatty things from the diet. This is important and the change into uh, from cow's milk to goat's milk preferably. This is the, the, the foundation of how we start to treat her because she's t on allopathic medicine as well. I don't want to use anything too strong and too quickly because it may have a knock on effect with the, the medication she's already taking. So it's a case of treating it very, very gently to start with and then build up to something stronger later on. I was quite surprised that there would be something for my dis uh, for my eczema that would have been prescribed by the prophets or the imams. In my condition and from what you've seen, um, how long do you expect it to take approximately? Um, if you're fully compliant with the <laughs> with the, uh, the the dietary stipulations and things, then within Within two weeks, you should see some difference. Okay, cool. Um, but within a month, def within a month, a period of a month, you definitely see some changes. Inshallah, I actually do have really high hopes for this. Um, I'm going in with a really open mind, to be honest, uh, not judging anything, just really positive outlook on it. Um, I've heard a lot of stories about people who have stopped with med modern medicine and chosen Islamic remedies or just herbal remedies and have had really good outcomes. So inshallah, just hoping for the best. Real healing takes at least a portion of the time over which an illness actually developed. If an illness developed over seven years, it will likely take at least one year to heal it completely. Yes, you might eradicate a bacterial infection with a 10-day course of antibiotics to bring relief to acute symptoms. But healing the root cause of the vulnerability to infection takes more time with additional time for the collateral damage caused by the antibiotics. Conventional medicine refers to methods of treatment which rely on the use of drugs, radiation and surgery. It is also known as allopathic, mainstream or western medicine. Due to increasing awareness in recent years, it has become notorious for its destructive side effects, which can often cause more damage than the illness that it seeks to treat. The miracle of Islamic healing, however, is that it does not entail the same shortcomings. And perhaps this is the reason why it is perceived as a threat to conventional medicine. Islamic medicine and traditional medicine in general is primarily concerned with root causes, which often begin at the level of the unseen. While Islamic medicine does deal with manifestations, it does so while simultaneously addressing the underlying cause of those manifestations. I often hear allopathic physicians denounce natural medicine outright, saying that there is no evidence that it works. But what I am actually hearing is that they have not reviewed the evidence, which is readily available with a simple internet search. This suggests that they are not interested in the evidence. Conventional medicine has dictated the terms of the discourse on medicine. For example, conventional medicine has defined what constitutes evidence and what does not. So the very paradigm of Islamic medicine that rests on the acknowledgement of a divine reality, the spirit, the soul, and the world of the unseen is refuted by conventional medicine. So Alhamdulillah, I've completed a whole week of gluten-free and dairy-free foods. It's my first week. And I started off by going to Tesco and I spent three hours trying to look for good foods. Um, usually I go crazy in Tesco and by the end of it I have like a whole trolley full of food. But this time I only had like a quarter of a trolley just because I couldn't find that much food that was gluten free and dairy free. And that looked appetizing. So I carried on the week trying to get used to the food. Um, and... It was a real challenge. I felt like I was physically restraining myself. Like sometimes I'd walk into the kitchen if I was hungry and then like I'd see my gluten-free breads, but then I'd see like cupcakes on the table or something like that or like um, pastries or something. And I'd literally just walk out of the kitchen because I, I couldn't even make my bread because I know I would just go for the cupcake. In terms of my skin, um, there hasn't been any improvements or any changes. 
Um, but I really wasn't expecting it um, because obviously it's a very slow process and I was aware of that. So I'm not surprised or anything like that. I'm hoping for changes maybe in week two. Um, but also I don't think it's necessarily the diet that's stopping the changes. I have had a very stressful week. So yeah, I feel like I might have to start using steroids. I have completely stopped. But I just feel like to recover from this like stress phase and how bad my eczema's gotten because of it, I feel like I'm just going to have to use steroids just to make it more manageable. But inshallah, it will get better. I am hoping for that. And um, hopefully next week, the stress will go and, you know, I'll just start um, hopefully enjoying the food better. Um, to be fair, the food is not that bad. The gluten-free bread, when you find the right brand, can be actually really good if you have it with, like, manuka honey or something like that. And also, like, goat's milk is really, really nice. Um, I like it more than dairy milk, actually. Um, and um, hopefully I'll try out things like the pasta and stuff like that, but we'll see how it goes, inshallah. What was different about the way the Prophet and the Imams treated their patients? Firstly, their approach was holistic. Instead of focusing on individual symptoms, they treated the person as a whole, physically, psychologically, emotionally and spiritually. Their approach was naturopathic. They relied on natural substances as opposed to synthetic ones. The Prophet, peace be upon him, is narrated to have said that verily for every disease Allah has sent the cure, creating for every disease a cure from plants and honey. An example from among the extensive list of recommendations of foods from the Imams is the consumption of raisins, especially on an empty stomach. Science proves that raisins are bursting with vitamins, minerals and antioxidants and are useful in the treatment and prevention of many diseases. Fevers, insomnia, hypertension and acidity can all be tackled with this superfood not to mention its extraordinary ability to prevent the formation of cancer cells in the body. Another superfood is the Ajwadate. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has recommended that one should start their day by eating seven Ajwadates in the morning. In 2013, a scientific study carried out on these dates, which are native to the region of Medina, west of Saudi Arabia, discovered its cyclooxygenase inhibitory effect that is similar to commercial anti-inflammatory drugs such as aspirin, ibuprofen and Celebrex. One of the most well-known and thoroughly studied substances, which occurs repeatedly within the narrations of the Prophet and the Imams, is raw honey. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, If a person eats honey, a thousand remedies enter his stomach and a million diseases will come out. Within natural medicine, honey is especially famous for its antibacterial properties. Alongside honey, the Prophet, peace be upon him, has also placed great emphasis on black seed. He says, there is healing in black seed for all diseases except death. Faisal is the managing director of Shifa Life, a family business based in Cambridge, which produces and sells black seed oil to customers worldwide. It started off small in 2002 and has expanded ever since supplying black seed oil to health food stores as well as selling online. The main reason we started black seed oil was, was the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and, and also we used it ourselves, so we knew how effective it was. And our friends and families and people who bought from us initially, uh, they were saying they were having amazing results. They've, uh, they've gone through the path of traditional uh, or mainstream medicine, and when it doesn't work, somebody recommends them black seed oil and they take black seed oil either for diabetes or for heart problems or um, there are some people who have even come with such severe you know, terminal illness, illnesses and, and they find relief. Its Latin name is Nigella sativa, but it's also referred to as fennel seeds, black cumin or kolonji seeds. It traces its origins to more than 3,000 years ago, when it was treasured by ancient Egyptian and Assyrian civilizations, who considered it a miracle cure for all ailments. Black seed can be taken internally. You can eat the seeds, um, or the most effective way is to drink the oil, because oil is quite concentrated. For example, uh, 100 grams of seed produces only 20 grams of oil, because it's uh, cold-pressed. And there are different ways of extracting the oil. There is a cold 
compressed way of extraction without using any heat or chemicals and that's the, that's the most recommended way where it keeps all the nutrients in place uh, doesn't destroy any of the active ingredients of black seed oil. Initially we started off with the pure black seed oil and then we made black seed oil capsules and then we uh, saw there was a market for combinations of black seed oil and other other ingredients. Say for example we have black seed oil and um, uh, garlic oil and people use it for heart, heart problems and circulatory problems. We have black seed oil and uh, a bitter melon which people use for um, diabetes. Then we have black seed oil and evening primrose oil. So we have a combination of uh, about 20 different products uh, which combines black seed oil. And then we have black seed oil and virgin coconut oil. Many people use it for um, uh, weight loss. And then the latest product we have is that black seed, crushed black seed with organic rainforest honey. So this is, uh, people use this for vitality and strength uh, and honey, as you know, is also a prized uh, superfood. Though black seed oil has always maintained popularity across the Middle East, it has only recently become popular in Europe. In 1995, a German doctor, after using black seed to successfully cure his horse of an asthma attack, was so astounded that he used it on one of his patients who was also cured. Black seed can now be found in every chemist in Germany and Austria, often prescribed for asthma and other diseases of the immune system. Modern research on black seed focuses on its effect on the immune system. So any ailment to do with the immune system, say for example skin disorders, um, asthma, allergies, uh, black seed is, oil is very good for and then as I mentioned for heart problems black seed oil is because it, it, it regulates the circulatory system and then also it is used for diabetes and again it regulates the sugar levels in the body and then uh, black seed oil is generally good for general well-being because it, um, it, it helps to create more uh, white blood cells uh, which helps with fighting many different diseases so Perhaps, you know, we don't know that's what the prophet meant by it's a, it's a cure for many, many ailments except for death because it does seem to work very strongly on the immune system. When the immune system of a person is strong, it helps prevent many diseases. I know a case in, at Adam Brooks Hospital. Um, it was a child who was to be admitted, administered some medicine and uh, whenever they put the needle in, they uh, found that it gets infected and somebody recommended to them black seed oil, uh, to use black seed oil as an anti-infectant um, and uh, they used it and, and, and it seemed to work and now they are doing research at uh, mainstream hospitals as well as the effectiveness of, of black seed oil. When we use it, um, I personally use it, use the honey and black seed as, uh, as a spread on toast for breakfast. So we have it for breakfast. And then, then especially during winter time, I take half a teaspoon of black seed oil in the morning and in the evening. Um, and then whenever our kids uh, fall down and have bruises, we just apply black seed oil for them. And then my wife uses as a hair oil mixed with olive oil, for example. We rarely go to the doctor, I mean, unless, for example, my daughter fell down and broke a bone. We go to the hospital. Uh, we can't do anything with black seed for that. Um, but otherwise, for day-to-day -day ailments and problems, we, we generally use black seed oil. Basically, what uh, the practitioners tell us is that uh, black seed oil brings balance in the body, uh, balance, balance in every different sense, balance in hormonal balance, the balance in um, nutritional balance, it brings balance in the body. So if the balance is brought, um, you know, it helps with so many uh, different ailments. It's a, it's a holistic way of uh, enhancing the natural defense systems of the body, the immune system. So this is now week two of the gluten-free, dairy-free diet um, for my eczema and just eating healthy all around. It's been going okay. Um, Alhamdulillah, I've already seen changes in my skin, which I didn't expect to see. So areas of my skin which had like a minor case of eczema have actually improved and cleared up completely, um, which is amazing, Alhamdulillah. 
Um, that being said, I have started to use steroids a little bit at the beginning of the week, just because the eczema from last week was too much to handle. So I just needed that help, but um, it was just a little bit and it was just like here and there. So I don't think it massively caused the improvement and I think the diet did have a big role to play. So that's really good as well. The diet is going okay. Um, I am getting used to the foods and I am starting to enjoy it a lot more. Um, so the foods, like actually eating it and enjoying it and like having food to eat is no longer the issue. But I realise that going out and socialising or even going to, going out to dinner with my family and stuff like that is just getting a lot harder. Oh, the Lila though, like um, going strong, haven't broken like the diet or anything. Um, actually, you know what I say that um, the other day I had Nahari and like I ate it and then I was thinking about it and I was like wait what is Nahari made of and then I realised you put flour in Nahari and I completely forgot so that wasn't on purpose though that was an accident I don't know if that counts but it hasn't made any differences to my skin my skin's getting better rather than worse so I'm just saying that didn't happen like I'm just kind of forget about that one so I'm actually really really thankful that it has already started making improvements I was actually expecting it to happen in week three um but it's been pretty quick um yeah, inshallah, excited to see what comes next. Much of the substances with great health benefits, which were taught by the Imam centuries ago, have only recently been discovered by modern scientists. Imam Ali al Hadi said, the best thing for malarial fever is saffron. Scientific studies confirm saffron is effective in reducing malarial parasites. He also recommended drops of rue with olive oil for treating ear infections, Scientific studies confirm that rue has anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial activity. Imam al-Sadiq recommended the consumption of rice for curing diarrhea and stomach problems. Scientific studies have confirmed that rice porridge is a lifesaver for chronic diarrhea. The Prophet recommended pomegranate for a long list of diseases. Science confirms that pomegranate has anti-helminthic and anti-diarrheal activity. The Prophet said that olive oil is a cure for 70 diseases. Science confirms that olive oil lowers cholesterol, elasticizes arteries, enhances respiratory tract, eradicates ringworm, fights cancer, and is an excellent emollient. Imam al Sadiq narrates that lovage is a good treatment for pain in the waist. Science confirms that lovage has diuretic properties and that it is good for the kidneys. He also said that lettuce purifies the blood. Scientific studies confirm that lettuce is anti-diabetic and protects the DNA from leukemia cells. The Prophet said garlic cures 70 diseases. Science confirms it is cardioprotective and that it has anti-tumor, antifungal, antiparasitic, antibacterial and anti-diabetic properties. The Prophet said that in the heart of man there is a seed of insanity that can only be prevented by Narcissus, which is a flower. Science shows Narcissus slows down the process of neurological degeneration and has anti alzheimer properties. We live in a time where we have an abundance of food available to us. A lot of it mass-produced. Um, we are exposed today much more to poisons as a result of the mass production of food, pesticides, hormones. Uh, and so it takes a fair amount of intelligence and research to, to live well today, to live safely. So I'm very careful about what I put into my body. I'm careful not to eat too much, which is a problem, especially in our country here in the United States, uh, to not make food too complicated, a meal having too many ingredients. We consume sugar today in a way that our ancestors never did. The sweet flavor has become a staple in a way that people of old um, did, not, did not have. And so, so it's important to understand that the way that we experience and know and relate with food today is very different than people of old that ate very simply and ate far less and, and, 
and their days really weren't structured around food in the way that, that our days have, uh, have been structured. Sayed Mohammed Rizvi is a fully qualified hijama therapist in London and has carried out the cupping procedure and clients for approximately three years. He has treated a diverse range of patients with various health problems who often walk away with success stories after only a couple of sessions of therapy. My name is Sayed Mohammed Rizvi um, and I have an advanced diploma in hijama therapy. Also, I've studied Tib, uh, tib Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim salam I studied that for a year when I was studying in the house of Qom in Iran. There I came across such a thing as Tib Ahl al-Bayt. I had no idea that such a thing even existed. Throughout my research and my study in this subject of Tib Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim salam I have come across more than 640 authentic narrations in the books of the Shia. That the books of the Shia contain more than 640 authentic sahih narrations from Ahlul Bayt salam, on the importance of this uh, al-hijama, the cupping, Islamic cupping. Cupping, in brief, is applying negative pressure to the affected area. It's like the opposite to a massage. When you get a massage, pressure is applied onto your, onto your body or onto that specific targeted area. With cupping, pressure or pressure or vacuum is created whereby negative pressure is applied and then fine incisions or cuts are placed onto that area and that uh, blood which was localized there in the very first place is then extracted. Hijama, um, I heard about it in my early teens uh, from some of my friends uh, in regards to a practice of uh, Rasulullah um, I did a bit of online research on what is hijama, what does it incorporate, uh, the benefits of hijama um, and uh, I saw a lot of testimonials uh, of people practicing it and uh, it was very beneficial for them, it helped a lot with uh, the muscle problems, muscle aches, muscle pains, um, illnesses such as like fever, hay fever, uh, flu um, and I thought that I should uh, try it out. The first time I tried hijama uh, or the cupping procedure upon myself was when I was living in the holy city of Qom in Iran. I was a student of the Hausa there. As I was studying Tib Ahl al-Bayt I really had the sudden urge you know, to have, it, have the procedure performed on myself. However, my teacher wanted me to wait until I study the theory. Then I reach the practical side of it. Then I learn it, I do it on someone, and then I have it performed on myself. But I really wanted to have it done on myself. And at the time I was suffering from hay fever. I constantly suffer from hay fever. I've been suffering for the past few years. But alhamdulillah, uh, it made such a great impact on my hay fever that I didn't have to use any tablets or you know eye drops or any of these prescri hay fever prescriptions that are available uh, at the local GP or over the counter. Just with hijama, I managed to cure my hay fever, alhamdulillah. So when I first uh, viewed a hijama on, on YouTube and things like that, it looked very clinical to me, like surgery. It didn't look as if, you know, uh, there was pain involved. It didn't look as if that there was, um, you know, something extreme or anything like that. Um, furthermore, I saw uh, the people that were getting hijama done, the actual patients were really, really calm and they were really, really, um, you know, relaxed. So I wasn't very skeptical at the beginning because um, I wasn't really sure. So I, I thought I'd research it properly. Um, also, I donate blood, so um, you know, needles. I'm not really scared of needles and pain and things like that. So it wasn't uh, uh, an issue of oh, is it really going to hurt me or anything like that. More on the side of okay, when hijama is practiced, what actually happens to the patient? Um, is he actually you know does he does he faint at all? Um, does he feel drowsy? Um, is he okay, you know, uh, recovery-wise uh, to get to get back up? Can he get back up and drive home? Can he not? Does he have to wait and rest? Uh, and I saw that with the the little scratches that they make and that the, the blood that they actually take out of the body, it's it's not a lot. Uh, so you don't have to really worry about oh, there's a drastic loss of blood or anything like that. It's, it's nothing like that with hijama. Generally speaking, hijama is very good for boosting the immune system, and everyone wants a strong immune system because it prevents from illnesses and diseases. It boosts the red blood cell count, the white blood cell count. It can treat conditions like constipation, migraines, headaches, back pains, um, especially women that suffer from uh, lower back pain, sciatic nerve pain. All of these things can be treated sometimes with only one session of hijama. And I speak from experience. I've had clients with just one session of hijama, alhamdulillah, that they have given up all medication. Many of these patients, the clients have told me they've been going to doctors for eight, nine, ten years 
for example, for a back pain, for lower back pain. After having done hijama once, they, you know, it was absolute, it, it came as a shock for them that something like this could actually do such a, you know, could do such a thing that medication hasn't been able to do for the past eight years. There was a client who was suffering from uh, acne, uh, very bad acne on the back. I think within two to three sessions of hijama, we managed to clear the whole back from acne. So we have uh, clients that suffer from acne, some on the back, some on the face. Uh, with hijama, you can tackle that uh, without having to need any creams or lotions or medication that, uh, that are usually prescribed for such a condition. So I went online to look for um, preferably a Shia brother that practices hijama. And uh, on Facebook, I came across um, a page where it was a, a Shia brother who was um, fully qualified, had studied hijama in Qum and also had government authority backing him on his uh, hygiene and that he is fully qualified to practice hijama in this country. Um, and then from there I uh, made an appointment. At the first time I did it with the brother, he was very professional, he was very uh, clean and hygienic. I mean, he had like rubber gloves on, he, his face was covered with a mask. Um, when he made the, uh, made the cuts, uh, I counted about 11 or 12 and I said, you've already cut me this many times. And he looked at me and he said, I've done 53, meaning that he was very, very professional. He was very, very smooth with the, the scalp and I could f hardly feel any pain. I could only feel scratches and I could only f I only felt 12 out of like the 53. So brother, if you could recite Ayatul Kursi as we begin. So we begin by spraying a little bit of olive oil on the client's back. And then when he put the suction cups on, he, he was really good that he actually massaged my body at the beginning, my back, uh, circulating the blood into like one position where he wanted to extract the blood from. So as you can see, this is one of the sunnati points between the two shoulder blades, just under the neck, shoulder blade, shoulder blade, right in the middle is one of the sunnati points which has been recommended in hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Imam Radha has a dua by the name of Dua Al-Hijama. Uh, and whenever I perform hijama on my clients and I work mainly with Mu'mineen, with Shia, I always make them recite Ayat Al-Kursi and Dua of Imam Radha alayhi salatu wasalam, Dua Al-Hijama. And inshallah with, with, with that comes the spiritual effect as well as the physical detoxification of the, of the body. Because hijama itself is a physical detoxification of the blood of the body from pathogens. Uh, from bacteria which helps clear acidic, thick, stagnant blood out of the body which tends to accumulate over the years. And you can see the thickness in the blood of the client and eventually these build up inside the body so all the pathogens toxins are extracted like this I feel uh, as if there's a lot of negativity leaving my body I feel there's a lot of stress leaving my body I feel there's a lot of bad energy leaving my body I feel a lot more clean I feel like there's a detox I feel like I feel light, um, it's very, very soothing, it's very, very calm, it's very, very peaceful. Um, I mean, if I was laying down in another position, I'd probably fall asleep. <laughs> Doing hijama definitely has made a significant improvement to my health. Um, because after I have a hijama session done, I feel very fresh, I feel very energetic. Uh, my muscles feel really refreshed. Uh, I feel like uh, cleansed and like there's been a detox in my body. Um, I have a really good sleep <laughs> the day I have a hijama session and um, I feel ready to tackle on the day and the week. Um, I feel my immune system has gone up, my overall attitude and, and energy uh, and aura has, has had a very, very positive effect since using hijama. I personally believe it is a forgotten sunnah of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. Especially in, in our community, in the Shia community, we f I feel that it is lacking me being involved in, in, the biz, in this business because I have my own, I, you know, this is my own little business in hijama. I find it very hard to find mu'mineen, believers that are interested in this department or either work in this field. Whereas the other Muslims are very, very active in this. My aim and the reason I did this was that 
I have spread this teaching of Ahlul Bayt, this forgotten Sunnah, amongst the Shia of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Salamullah alayhi. That why should our why should the believers, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, struggle in life when such a miracle is available? By just one hijama, you feel such a great change in your body. You feel relaxed. You feel fresh. You feel your symptoms have almost disappeared. Why, though we have this in our books, in books of the Ahlul Bayt, why should we stay away from it? Why should we not make uh, use of it? Why should we not take advantage of it? My advice to anyone who has never done it, at least try it once before you come to a conclusion or before you make a judgment. Try it for yourself and you shall see the change yourself, inshallah. So this is now week three of the gluten-free, dairy-free diet and alhamdulillah it's actually been my favourite week so far and I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that the impact the diet is having on my skin is so much more evident than it was before. Like there are significant changes in my skin, um, even in terms of colour, like my skin just looks healthier. Um, the flaring has gone down, a lot of the eczema has cleared up. Um, obviously it's not gone completely but like I said significant changes like I can see the end goal and it just motivates me to keep going with this diet that much more in terms of the actual diet itself things are looking equally as good um, I think that's because I've like really branched out and taken it a lot more seriously um, because like I said I really really enjoy food so I think for this to go well I really need to start enjoying the food that I eat um, for this diet so and actually taking it seriously as well in terms of like looking at the gluten-free dairy-free food I'm buying and recognizing that some of it even though it is gluten-free and dairy-free is still really really unhealthy like um a lot of it will be processed and a lot of it will just have a huge amount of sugar where the dairy or gluten should be so um yeah so there's been a lot of like keeping an eye on that and just adding a lot more vegetable and a lot more fruits into my diet um and just like even like drinking a lot more water and just taking care of myself like that i feel like i'm going on this health craze but it's just been really really good and i feel like i have so much more energy because of that and I just feel positive like all the time. It's been a really good week. For myself, I found things, for example, like dates, very beneficial for stopping diarrhea. So I used that on myself. Apples, again, the Imams have said eat apples because they clean the system, clean the, the digestive system. And again, I practiced that. The, um, the use of having almonds and raisins, eating these in the morning, I found increase your energy levels and help with the memory. This again is directly from Tibla Imma. There's the advices of the, especially Imam Ali alayhi salam, where he says, um, eat only when you feel you have to eat and stop before you're full. That I found very, very useful because when you eat to your full, you create other illnesses for yourself and tiredness and fogginess of the mind and that type of thing. And also the, the other thing I find really useful is if I've eaten, then I, I like to walk after I've eaten because it helps the system. You, you feel more energized. If you just simply sit and you eat, then you just, you feel tired and fatigued and you know, you, you, you feel, you don't feel well. My father was my first teacher of Islamic medicine, which he learned from his family, as well as five decades of global travel before I was even born. My father took care of us with Islamic medicine and conventional medicine as needed. So I lived Islamic medicine before I discussed it or read about it. By the age of six, I was reciprocating the techniques that he was teaching me. My study with him was not textual, but contextual through direct experience. It was a study of life through my very being and secondarily through observation. Very, very rarely do I have to use conventional medicine. I use uh, herbal medicine or just dietary changes on a, on a daily basis. So, and same for my children, they only have natural things. They don't have any medicines from me, allopathic medicines anyway. I rarely get sick. When I do, I transition through it fairly quickly, largely because I know what to do. However, I am not invulnerable. I was quite ill on several occasions while growing up, through which, however, I learned a great deal about healing. 
and as I increased in knowledge and cultivation, my episodes of illness diminished. If I was invulnerable, I would not be a good healer because I would not be able to relate with people's suffering, which is critically important in holding a space of healing for people. The last time I was ill was approximately, I think it was two, one or two years ago on Arvain. I caught a cold because of the coldness being exposed and sleeping outside. Um, when I returned home, I treated myself with herbal medicine and within three days it was all gone. So this is now week four of the gluten-free, dairy-free diet and I'm not even going to lie, I cheated. Um, I did not do it intentionally though. I was in situations where I was really hungry and um, there was literally nothing I could eat except for food that had gluten and dairy. Obviously all those small amounts add up and it has really affected my skin really quickly as well. Um, I feel like I feel it feels the way it did before obviously not to that extent but it does feel aggravated it does feel itchy um a, a bit of eczema has come back especially in my face obviously um it's put me a step back in actually having better skin and eczema free skin so um I'm really disappointed in myself and I'm really really not enjoying it as well because the fact that I am itchier now and I, I do have like um like worse skin than I did before is just stressing me out and that stress is obviously like making it worse. It's as acting as a catalyst and just furthering the progression of like bad skin. I guess the silver lining in all of this is that the food that um I had no longer looks appealing like the cake and like the butter chicken and stuff like that it just does not look appealing I don't want to go near it just because I've literally seen how strong the negative effect it has on me really is and how quickly it can affect me as well so and just the fact that it's just not worth it like it really isn't worth it so that's I guess the the good thing that came out of this week um but yeah just going into next week really hoping for um, quick changes and better skin. Statistically, it's almost impossible to go through life without the support of conventional medicine. And this is perfectly fine. It is not synonymous with failure of any kind. Nevertheless, spiritually, however, anything is possible. Those who really live the principles of Islamic medicine can taste this possibility. I can attest to this as someone who lives according to these principles. I have not had medical insurance for the last 30 years. My last scheduled medical doctor visit was as a teenager because it was required before entering university. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a good idea, that conventional medicine is bad, but rather that knowledge is empowering and transformative. If you are nourishing health, then you are not likely to make or contract an illness, so you are not beholden to a model of illness management. Assalamu alaikum, this is now week five of the gluten-free dairy-free diet, and this is the last week I'm gonna be documenting how the diet's been going. So obviously I'm gonna be keeping up the diet past week five and you know, like probably for the rest of my life. So alhamdulillah, the diet has been going really, really well for week five. Um, I've completely recovered from like that little mishap from week four and even progressed further than that. So I think the diet in general has probably gotten rid of at least like 50 to 60 percent of my eczema. And when I mean like gotten rid of, I mean like it's not coming back, like it's gone. Um, and I know that because like when I before, when my eczema would improve and I'd have a flare up, then it would just go back to the to the state it was before it improved. But now, when I have like flare ups from like bad days of like um stress or lack of sleep or something like that, then it flares up, but hardly like to such a minor extent that I don't even need to acknowledge it. Um, whereas before, I'd have to go to like ridiculous degrees to take care of it and like bring it back down to like a manageable level. But now it's just like. I don't 
need to do anything like I don't spend hours moisturizing and like using steroids and harming my skin through them like I literally remember there were days where um I'd go to different places and my skin would just be so painful because of the eczema that I just need to leave where I am and just stick my face outside of like a window just to cool it down for like half an hour like just like ridiculous things like that just because of small flare-ups and now like I don't even need to like worry about them at all I've actually spent my whole life accepting the fact that it's probably going to be dominated by me taking care of my eczema and I'm going to spend my whole life looking after my skin in ways that aren't even looking after it. like the steroids clearly were not doing any good for my skin and if they would they would like um clear up for a little while and then um, my skin would just like not react to them anymore so I'd have to try another one or a stronger one and like just constantly going to the GP going to the dermatologist buying new steroids like it was just this annoying process that I would always have to go through and like I never felt like it positive about it or that it was going to work because I've been going through it for so long it was so useless but now like just because I've changed my diet and I'm having like this tablespoon of oil like every now and again like my skin is so much better it's just it's kind of hard to believe um and I'm really really grateful because I just like I honestly feel like my whole life has changed I just I really don't know how to describe how great this is and I don't think anyone would really understand that unless they've actually suffered through eczema to this extent because there's just situations in your life that you have to go through because of your eczema and they just put you down so much and like I just can't believe that I'm never gonna have to go through those situations again because I truly believe like this diet will completely get rid of my eczema I literally say anyone struggling with any skin problems just give it a try stop all the medication you're taking all the things the GP just keeps shoving your way and just try something natural and healthy and I promise you you will not be disappointed Islamic medicine leaves no stone unturned in providing natural and holistic treatments for the health and well-being of the human body. Despite attempts to denounce this form of alternative therapy as baseless and deficient of scientific backing, the evidence is clear for those who wish to see it.